Hi everyone and welcome to your online lecture for the course Pathophysiology 2. In today's lecture we're covering respiratory disorders. This is one of two online lectures covering disorders of the respiratory system. Here's a list of the pathophysiological pathophysi themes that we will be addressing throughout this topic. The clinical manifestations of respiratory disorders, so when I say clinical manifestations, remember I'm referring to the signs, the symptoms, the evidence of disease or disorder, and they can vary depending on the particular respiratory disorder, vary depending on the severity and the person, but cough, pretty obvious one that can be dry or productive. Sometimes individuals will suffer from hematitis, which is the coughing up of blood rather than just uh, mucus, for example, or, or just a watery substance. Dyspnea, we know means shortness of breath. Orthopnea, we spoke about being a type of dyspnea, but these individuals experience this shortness of breath when they're lying flat on their back. So we've talked quite a bit about how these individuals will, will let their family doctor know or let whatever practitioner they're seeing know that they can't sleep lying on their back and the only way that they feel that they can sleep without shortness of breath is sitting up or, or propped up to some extent. Cyanosis is that bluish kind of haze that's in the skin and the mucous membranes due to reduced oxygen. Clubbing can also be seen and this is seen at the fingernails. There's some good images in your textbook where the, the nail and the tip of the finger is sort of rounded out like a, a drumstick and this is seen with chronic cyanosis. Pain, so this is interesting because the lungs don't have pain receptors but pain receptors are present in the upper airways but not in the lungs but when the lungs hurt is when the pleura itself is inflamed and so this is called pleuritic pain and these individuals will uh, suffer from pain when when breathing. Shane Stokes respiration. We talked about this in this course, but also anatomy and physiology. This is a respiration that can be seen, for example, in individuals that have brainstem injury. Uh, maybe there's increased intracranial pressure that damages the respiratory centers of the brainstem. And this type of breathing is a periodic abnormal breathing that's seen in usually term terminally ill or brain damaged patients and it's oftentimes described or characterized by alternating periods of apnea where these individuals stop breathing and hyperventilation. So they go from hyperventilating to not, to not breathing, hyperventilating to not breathing. Quick review of normal anatomy of the respiratory tract. So we have our upper respiratory system consisting of our nasal cavity uh, and then our pharynx, which consists of the naso, the oro, and the laryngopharynx, the larynx, and sort of really that upper part of the trachea, part of our respiratory tract. But our lower respiratory tract is the majority of the trachea also including these bronchi, so our left and right prim primary bronchi. Then we get further secondary branching. We end up with bronchioles. And then, of course, at the end part, we have what are called alveoli. And it's the alveoli where gas exchange takes place because of the presence of blood vessels throughout. So this is where, when air comes in, the oxygen will go into into the capillary network through the alveoli and then be oxygenated and, and bind with hemoglobin and travel back to your heart to be pumped out to the rest of, of the body. But this is also the level where carbon dioxide will be converted into a gas and that the way it's been carried in the blood then converted back into a gas and then brought, allowing us to breathe it out. So we'll start with upper airway disorders. Quick reminder about the sinuses. Remember, they are part of the respiratory system and we have paranasal sinuses, so they're found on either side of, of the nose or the nasal region. And these nasal cavities are lined with respiratory epithelium and they're also lined with mucosal glands. So you've probably yourself had, had a sinus infection, which is called sinusitis, where the the epithelium becomes very inflamed and, and mucus, excess mucus can be produced. And 
this sinus inflammation that occurs can cause just inflammation where pain is felt from inflammation alone. Sometimes excessive mucus can be produced and it can turn into an infection that sometimes, if bacterial, needs to be treated with antibiotics. The two types of upper airway obstructions that are seen in children that we're talking about today include epiglottitis and croup. Now the epiglottis, you might remember that as being the flap structure that when you swallow covers your trachea so that food can move through the esophagus and not through the trachea. And this structure can become inflamed. So remember, itis is inflamed, so it's inflammation of the epiglottis. It can be related often times to a viral infection. Sometimes it can be inflamed because of an allergic reaction. And if it becomes inflamed enough, it can cause asphyxia, which is a condition where a person can't breathe. So choking, for example, is, an exam is a type of asphyxia. And croup we'll have a look at on the next slide. Croup is defined as acute inflammation of the larynx, so voice box, the trachea, and the main bronchi leading to airway obstruction. Croup illnesses are characterized by really infection and obstruction of the upper airways. More commonly seen in children under the age of five and during the winter months. It's usually viral in origin, so it can be caused by influenza as well as respiratory syncytial virus also known as RSV for short. When infants suffer from croup, it can be very, very scary to see um, when this is presented. During croup, there is inflammation and edema of the upper, upper, upper airway that can lead to upper airway obstruction, creating resistance to airflow. So with inspiration and expiration, there's resistance. In serious cases, it can lead to collapse of the upper airways and leading to respiratory failure. So with this increased resistance then to airflow, it can lead to the person having to work harder to breathe. So it increases the workload of breathing, which can generate more negative intrathoracic pressure, which can end up collapsing the upper airway, leading to, to uh, respiratory failure. Now we'll move on to talking about airway disorders, in particular bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is persistent abnormal dilation of the bronchial segment. So it happens in segments. And you can see on this image here that there are three different types. We have saccular, varicose, and cylindrical. But we're not going to be talking about these individually. Just be aware that these are the different variations of this persistent abnormal dilation of a, bronchi of a bronchial segment. So when there's inflammation of the bronchial wall, so in one part of it, it can lead to destruc destruction of the elastic and the muscular components that make it up. And this can cause the wall to weaken and then dilate. And this is, this there's a variety of different reasons why this can happen, but it can happen, for example, when an area is experiencing chronic inflammation, such as what would happen with smokers. People can also inherit, it can be a gen genetically inherited, this condition. The primary symptom in these individuals with bronchiectasis is cr a chronic productive cough that can last months or even years. Now in the dilated segment, so where it dilates and becomes weak, we get turbulent airflow through this dilated area. It's not moving properly, it's not clearing out the area properly, and mucus can collect within that dilated area and really get stuck. And when it gets stuck there, it can, it can collect fungus, it can connect, collect bacteria, which end up forming like a biofilm, which is where these microorganisms are all stuck to each other along a surface, making creating this slimy layer. And then as you can imagine, this can lead to infection in the lower airways. And then if it's a bacterial infection, it can, this individual might need antibiotics. Uh, it can be identified 
or one of the presentations that can occur is this foul smelling sputum with a cough. This shows you here how bronchiectasis looks. You have a bronchography on the left and the lower segment here is affected with bronchiectasis and on the right, this is showing you cylindrical bronchiectasis through this region here. So dilated bronchi and bronchioles. Now we're gonna move on to talking about a different airway disorder called bronchial asthma, or as you would know it, asthma. This is a type one hypersensitivity reaction. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the bronchial mucus that ends up causing bronchial hyperresponsiveness. It leads to constriction of airways and variable airflow obstruction, and it is reversible. So it's not something that happens consistently all of the time. There are you know, periods where a person is, is fine. So we'll look at what, what can happen with an asthmatic response when somebody responds to an allergen. And we'll look at what happens at an immunological level. So asthma caused by the presence of an antigen that we're calling an allergen will ultimately form IgE or immunoglobin E. Immunoglobin E are antibodies produced by the immune system. So if you have an allergy, your immune system overreacts to this allergen by producing antibodies called immunoglobulin E. These antibodies will travel to cells that release chemicals causing an allergic reaction. So let's see how that looks. The allergen or the antigen here is going to enter the airway from the air. So this could be pollen, for example. You can see it entering within and binding to mast cells. Mast cells that are, are covered in really uh, preformed IgE. The mast cells will degranulate, which you can see happening, and they'll release mediators such as, for example, histamines, leukotrienes, bradykinin, prostaglandins, and many of the secreted secreted mediators are going to induce such events as bronchospasm. So this is where the, the smooth muscle within the airway constricts, spasms. It can lead to edema from increased capillary permeability, evident here, as well as airway mucus secretion from goblet cells, leading to what is sometimes referred to as an asthmatic crisis especially with the smooth muscle constriction, and these individuals might start to wheeze because of this. Now at the same time, so we kind of looked at this direction, at the same time the antigen is going to be detected by dendritic cells, so that's the dendritic cell here, that present the antigen to these helper T cells, or Th2 cells, ultimately leading skipping a few steps for what we don't need to know for this course, ultimately leading to the development of more immunoglobin E. So activation of all of these different, inf different inflammatory cells that we've talked a lot about when we spoke about inflammation naturally are going to worsen the inflammation experienced by these people suffering from this allergen exposure. So when someone is exposed to an allergen or some sort of irritant, the immune system will be activated. And we talked on the previous slide about IgE production. And this can then lead to mast cell degranulation. Mast cell degranulation has the ability to, re to release vasoactive mediators as well as chemotactic mediators. The vasoactive mediator mediators will have an effect on vasodilation and increased per capillary permeability, which can lead to a variety of the different clinical manifestations of asthma, leading to airway obstruction. The mast cell degranulation will also release chemotactic mediators, as already mentioned, which will further worsen the inflammation that we saw in the previous slide. There are neuro neuropeptides that are found in uh, human and animal airways and they can become toxic. And the release of these toxic neuropeptides can lead to epithelial destruction as well as fibrosis, which can then lead to airway obstruction.
This highlights the major events of bronchial asthma. So we know that about the degranulation of mast cells, mucus accumulation, formation of a mucus plug, which can lead to much trouble with inhalation and exhalation, but more so with exhalation because of its passive nature. And also because during expiration, the airways are normally narrowed as it is during this phase of respiration. And so when any of these contribute well, we have smooth muscle contraction as well, or constriction, any of these are going to be individually and collectively leading to labored breathing. And wheezes are are commonly heard in these individuals. I'd also like to point out the hyperinflation of the alveoli. So when we are plugged here, air will take a different route and overinflate other alveoli. Now we're going to move on to a different airway disorder called cystic fibrosis. This is an autosomal recessive inherited disease that results from, from defective epithelial chloride ion transport. The cystic fibrosis gene is located on chromosome 7 as we'll see on an upcoming slide and there are so many variants of this, of this gene, thousands. In, it's a disease that does not only affect the lungs, which is a common misconception, it affects other areas as well. For example, the digestive tract and or digestive organs and the reproductive organs, as we'll see shortly. This is what a lung that, this is end stage cystic fibrosis, but it shows you where the name itself was originated. So cystic because of the amount of cysts that form in these individuals and fibrosis because of the the presence of, well, you can see the white areas that's collagen. So the tissues become fibrotic. In this image, you can see that there are hemorrhages that are evident in the lower lobes. A key feature with cystic fibrosis includes widespread mucus impaction of airways which can lead to bronchiectasis, as we discussed earlier. So here's a summary of the different causes of cystic fibrosis. It's a genetic defect that I mentioned on chromosome 7. The genetic defect is in the chloride channel in every cell in the body. And these chloride channels are normally very important for exocrine glands. Chloride and sodium together form sodium chloride, which attracts water. So secretions from our body, from exocrine glands that would normally have sodium and chloride and therefore water, don't. And they end up being very thick because of this lack of water leading to obstructions. And so sometimes it's described as being uh, viscid and viscid refers to a sticky. So there's that word viscid here. And it can lead to the development of a microenvironment that is protective of microbial agents. So it allows microbes to flourish. These individuals will commonly have airway obstructions, but also infections because they can't clear out the area very well. So remember that this doesn't only happen in the bronchial glands, but every exocrine gland. So for example, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the salivary glands, the testes, and the sweat glands can all be affected with cystic fibrosis, but it's most dramatic in the airways. And finally, these individuals can end up with chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis as already mentioned, and respiratory failure. This second image here is from the textbook and it really states the same thing. So we have that gene mutation, decreased chloride secretion and ion, ion transport, leading to increased water absorption. So we end up with reduced, reduced consistency of the mucus called, and this is a key feature, dehydrated mucus. The body has a difficult time clearing that mucus and in itself becomes an airway obstruction. Then bacteria can and thrive in that area leading to infection. We know that we have all of those inflammatory mediators that, that are present that further worsen the problem. And here we have an effect of bronchiectasis. Remember that bronchiectasis is that persistent abnormal dilation of the, of the bronchi. And then it could lead to respiratory failure as well.
Now we'll move on to talking about alterations of gas exchange and oxygen transport. So really the mechanisms that end up causing hypoxemia, which is low oxygen within the arterial blood. So the next uh, few slides will go through four different causes of hypoxemia. This slide summarizes hypoxemia caused by impaired oxygen delivery to the alveoli, which can be a result of either altered oxygen content or altered ventilation. Remember back to normal anatomy that we spoke about the partial pressure of oxygen within the alveoli and how it's that the it's the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli that will affect how much oxygen ends up in the blood and that can be seen in this image here so here's an alveolus here is deoxygenated blood at the level of the capillary and then we have oxygenated blood and you'll notice that in order for oxygen to diffuse into the blood from the alveoli the partial pressure of oxygen needs to be higher than what it is in in the venous blood and because of that pressure difference oxygen will be driven into the capillary and then you can see so that's with oxygen when we're picking it up but the same thing occurs with carbon dioxide where if we are to deliver carbon dioxide from our our capillaries or blood vessels into the alveoli to get rid of them then the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood vessels has to be greater than the partial pressure of carbon dioxide within the alveolus so if there is reduced pressure if that partial pressure isn't as high as it should be then we end up with less oxygen available and delivered into the bloodstream in addition, ventilation, altered ventilation can occur. Ventilation is controlled by the vagus nerve, and that in turn is controlled by the brainstem. So we have these respiratory centers within our brainstem. So if somebody has a disease of the brainstem, then it can alter ventilation, which can then lead to hypoxemia. So if ventilation is altered and becomes abnormal, then we're not able to get as much oxygen into the body. The brainstem, you might remember, is sensitive to pH and it's sensitive to, to carbon dioxide. And so if carbon dioxide levels are too high, if pH is low, so the blood is acidic, this can be detected by chemoreceptors found in the brainstem, which can then alter ventilation accordingly. But people who have a brainstem injury, they might have damage to their respiratory centers, which means that they don't respond properly when they're in states of, let's say, acidosis, where their pH is too low and can become acidotic. Now we'll talk about another type of hypoxemia and this this one's caused by alterations in oxygen diffusion into the blood and this remember that diffusion of oxygen into the blood occurs between the alveoli and the capillaries through a alveolar wall and there's a lot of layers for oxygen to have to cross through so if we look at this image here you can see that there is so if we have the alveolus here oxygen within it we have this surfactant layer we have an alveolar epithelial layer, we have a basement membrane, we have the interstitial space, and then we have the capillary endothelium. And so oxygen has to be able to diffuse through all of these layers in order to get into the blood vessel where it will then bind to, to the red blood cell or to the hemoglobin. And any of these layers can be damaged, and if they're damaged, it can change the ease of diffusion, which could then lead to hypoxemia. And this slide will become more important when we talk about certain lung disorders in in the next some upcoming in the upcoming lecture in order for gas diffusion to occur we need to have good ventilation to the alveoli but also good perfusion of the blood and so this balance between alveolar ventilation and perfusion is referred to as the VQ mismatch if it is mismatched or there's normal VQ. So we'll talk about normal VQ. Again, this is ventilation, alveolar ventilation and perfusion. We'll talk about normal, low, very low and high. Now in the case of normal VQ, what you can see here is that this deoxygenated blood that comes in from the pulmonary arteries and at the level of the capillaries surrounding the alveoli, you can see that 
ventilation is good, it's getting into the alveoli, and it's also perfusing into, diffusing into the blood properly, and so all of this blood leaves oxygenated so that it returns through the pulmonary veins to the left side of the heart to be pumped out to the body. With low VQ though, so in this upper right image, this is where you might have some sort of uh, bronchial asthma, maybe it's constricted, maybe there's a mucus plug, and you can see what ends up happening is poor airflow into the alveoli and you can see the change of the alveoli. And so this alveoli is not oxygenating blood. So even though blood is still present there, it's not being oxygenated. And so it leaves deoxygenated and mixes with the oxygenated blood. On the lower left, this is more severe. This is very low VQ, which is sometimes known as, as a shunt. This is where complete blockage of ventilation to an alveoli occurs and you get complete, complete collapse of that alveolus, but blood supply still occurs. So you, instead of this blood supply uh, being shunted to another alveoli, it runs through deoxygenated and mixes with the oxygenated blood. And then in this final example, high VQ, Perfusion is reduced in this case. So you can see blood perfusion is reduced or impaired even though the alveoli is fine and ventilation, ventilation could be fine. And a potential cause of this could be pulmonary thromboembolism that's blocking off and impairing the normal perfusion. So there was some sort of obstruction of branches of the pulmonary artery from a thromboembolism. And so it forms what's called alveolar dead space. So the alveoli receive air, so ventilation is, is, is fine, but no actual diffusion occurs. So you can see that in any of these cases, you have venous blood that comes in and venous blood that, and, and it's venous blood when it leaves as well. Again, remembering back to normal anatomy, when hemoglobin molecules bind with oxygen, it forms oxyhemoglobin. This hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen, and so we call it hemoglobin saturation, and this occurs naturally at the level of the lungs. And then hemoglobin desaturation would occur at the level of the tissues where oxygen is released from hemoglobin. This graph on this slide shows you what it looks like when this hemoglobin saturation and desaturation is plotted on a graph. And so this curve represents or is referred to as a oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And this is from your textbook. And you can see that it forms almost like an S-shaped curve. So when the partial pressure of oxygen is less than 60 millimeters mercury, so we're moving in this direction, it is unloaded into tissues. And at this point, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen decreases. So why is that? Well, remember, at the level of the tissues, we want to unload it. We don't want oxygen to remain attached to hemoglobin. We want it unloaded. Now, when it's above this, so when the partial pressure of oxygen is above 60 millimeters mercury, so moving now in the other direction, hemoglobin is completely saturated with oxygen in the lungs. This is when the curve ends up becoming relatively flat. An important point to make too is that in cases of acidosis, so we're looking here, cases of acidosis or low pH or hypercapnia, which is high carbon dioxide, this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve ends up taking a shift to the right. You can also see that the curve is shifted to the left in cases of alkalosis, so increase in pH, or hypocapnia, which is reduced partial pressure or reduced carbon dioxide. So remember that we want high affinity when we pick up oxygen at the levels of the lungs and lower when we want to drop it off. And you can see then the list of the different conditions that can impact affinity. Now we'll talk about pulmonary edema.
Pulmonary edema is very basically defined as excess water in the lung. Now, normally our lungs should contain very little fluid and it's kept dry because we have a lymphatic system in place that can drain it along with all of these vascular pressure changes that keep fluid levels in balance. We also have surfactant as part of our alveoli, and you might remember that as being a substance that helps prevent collapse of the alveoli because it repels water. And so in somebody who doesn't have surfactant functioning properly, or maybe it's not there at all, then the water, water within the lungs can cause it to collapse. And you can see the presence of pulmonary edema represented here in this drawing when you compare it to normal. In the bottom image, the pink area representing the alveoli, this should, should look white in a normal lung because of it being an air cavity. And of course, no ventilation or gas diffusion can occur at these affected levels. This slide shows you the different mechanisms by which pulmonary edema can occur and it might look familiar because we looked at the right side of this chart when we spoke about lung cancer last term. The blue boxes, so starting on the left, an example of a common cause of pulmonary edema is left heart failure as blood backs up into the pulmonary system. So to describe it a little bit more, remember that when the left ventricle fails, blood backs up into the pulmonary circulation which can cause changes in pressure. So hydrostatic pressure increases from the fluid itself. So we have so much excess fluid within the pulmonary system that it has high hydrostatic pressure, which exceeds oncotic pressure. And this causes fluid to leave the vessels and enter the interstitial area of the lungs. This fluid can be maybe picked up to some extent by our lymphatic system, but it wouldn't take long in this situation for our lymphatic system to be overloaded, leading to what's sometimes referred to as alveolar flooding and then pulmonary edema. On the yellow, if there's a blockage in lymphatic vessels, such as with, we talked about lymphedema last term, if somebody has lung cancer, maybe they have tuberculosis, it can block the lymph nodes and this can prevent lymphatic drainage, leading to the the accumulation of fluid and then pulmonary edema. And finally in pink, this is more rare when there's injury to the, the capillary endothelium within the lungs. This can happen with a particular disease referred to as acute respiratory distress syndrome. It can also happen from the use of certain drugs. We will actually talk about acute respiratory distress system, system syndrome on a different day, but what ends up happening is this increased capillary permeability because of injury to the capillary endothelium structure loses its integrity. There's also disruption of surfactant production by the alveoli from this destruction, which ends up leading to a fluid and plasma proteins that leak into the interstitial space, leak into the alveoli, leading to pulmonary edema. Our next condition is called atelectasis, which is the collapse of lung tissue. There are three types of atelectasis, compression atelectasis, absorption atelectasis, and surfactant impairment. A common mechanism that can cause alveoli to become atelectic include a mucus plug. So let's, for example, say that there was a mucus plug in this location, eventually when air can no longer inflate the alveoli because of its being blocked, it can lead to what's referred to as atelectasis. This slide shows you the difference between absorption and compression atelectasis. The obstruction, so let's say by mucus or, or a foreign body, this can cause collapse of that alveolar tissue distal to it. There could be bronchial cancer, for example, that blocks part of the lungs. Compression atelectasis at the bottom here, we can be caused by a space occupying lesion compressing from the outside of the lungs from the pleural cavity or from the thoracic wall. So it's caused by some sort of external pressure exerted on the lung tissue outside of the lungs. So there could be a tumor outside of the lungs that puts pressure on the lung tissue. Atelectasis can occur at the base of the lung and be caused by even abdominal distension that presses upwards, causing compression and subsequent atelectasis or collapse of the affected alveoli.
The third type, surfactant impairment, this is where there's either decreased production of surfactant or inactivation of surfactant, allowing for an increase in surface tension and subsequent collapse of the alveoli. This can be seen, for example, with premature births or with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So just a summary, some sort of obstructed airway, could be a mucus plug, could be cancer within the lungs, could be a foreign body in there, can cause absorption, atelectasis, and you can see the collapse or the atelectasis occurring here. And then the other type, compression atelectasis, occurs when there's some sort of space-occupying lesion or something that puts pressure on the lungs causing atelectasis, and then surfactant when that's in production is impaired or it's inactive will lead to increase in surface tension leading to atelectasis. Chest wall and pleural disorders is our next topic. It's obvious to state but lung ventilation depends on the integrity of our, our chest wall. So if the chest wall is damaged then naturally it's going to affect ventilation. On the left here the chest wall can be restricted in cases of immobility, spinal column distortion, so especially with severe scoliosis, certain neuromuscular diseases, and with obesity. So in other words, fat, muscles, bones can lead to chest wall restriction if they're in some way or another restricting or, or altering normal movement patterns that are necessary for ventilation. And these individuals will often have shallow respiration, which as you would expect would impact ventilation. On the right, the chest wall can be in, become unstable or unstable caused by trauma, caused by fractures. So this can be seen in trauma centers quite frequently and, some, and described as flail chest. So you can see here that fracture of the ribs can lead to instability and it can cause very very disorganized breathing lung ventilation is not as efficient then in these cases and the chest wall will need to be fixed in order to correct for this two additional situations that can affect ventilation involve pneumothorax and pleural effusion a pneumothorax is the presence of air in the pleura and this can happen when the thoracic wall is damaged We'll have a look at pneumothorax a little closer on the next page, on the next slide. And pleural effusion. The pr this is the presence of fluid in the pleural cavities. And this is a, a very obvious image here showing you the level of fluid. Now this fluid can be different types. It can be made of, it can be water, so it's called a hydrothorax. It can be made of, full of pus really from infection and that's called epiema, and it could be blood that is found within the pleural cavities, and that's called a hemothorax. This image here gives you a good reminder about the layers of the lungs. So we have this parietal layer, parietal pleura on the outside, and then we have this visceral pleura on the inside covering the lung, the viscera itself, and then we have the pleural space in between. And there's some individuals that can have a weaker area of the lung with certain lung diseases, and they can have this bleb formation. And pulmonary bleb, bleb is a small collection of air between the lung and the outer surface of the lung, so the visceral pleura, usually found in the upper lobe. And when this bleb ruptures, it can allow air to escape the lung into the pleural cavity, and this causes a pneumothorax. On the right side here, you can see an open and a tension pneumothorax. This open pneumothorax, which will occur from some sort of trauma, Air can move, so if we're looking at inspiration and expiration, air can still move in, and you can see that air can still move out through that opening. But with a tension pneumothorax, tension, it builds up within because air moves in, but air can't move out. And this can continue to worsen as air fills and can't be breathed out, and it can start to displace other structures such as the heart and the other lung. So how is this corrected? Well, it's corrected by allowing air to escape.
Um, it can it can be lethal from more than one perspective, but it can also put so much pressure on on the heart that it's it fails in what it's supposed to do. Okay, that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you for listening.